Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Musical Fair Cabaret here on Damien College campus. My name is Craig Harris, and I'm the Vice President for Institutional Advancement here at Damien. And I'm truly honored to have this opportunity to welcome our presenter today, Senator Tim Kennedy. The Damien College Distinguished, Lecture, uh, Distinguished Leadership Lecture Series was created six years ago by President Gary A. Olson to provide the community with an opportunity to hear from local, national, and international speakers. To date, we have had 18 informative presentations discussing issues like Buffalo's local resurgence, U.S. presidential campaigns, and many other programs including an emerging uh, India and Indo-American relations. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our president, Gary Olson. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here today. We're honored to have State Senator Timothy Kennedy with us today as our featured speaker in the Damon College Distinguished Leaders Lecture Series. I'd like to begin, though, by recognizing several distinguished guests who are with us this afternoon. With us are several Damon College Board of Trustee members, uh, Kathy Lolly Best, Audrey Bunis, <coughs> Robert Kaur, and Dr. Jennifer Gursky DePirio are with us. So please help me welcome them. Also with us is a former Damon trustee, the Honorable Judge Barbara Howe, who recently retired from the Erie County Circuit Court. And also with us is the Honorable Jennifer Sturgeon, who is the Erie County Administrative Law Judge, a Damon College adjunct professor, and a candidate for New York State Attorney General. So thank you. Now, our speaker, Senator Tim Kennedy, was elected to the State Senate in 2011. Uh, during his successful tenure as Senator, he's been a strong advocate for Western New York seniors, the region's workforce, and child protection, including spearheading the passage of JJ's law to stiffen penalties on repeat child abusers. He's been involved in legislation to reform child protective services to protect victims of domestic violence. Prior to his service in the State Senate, Senator Kennedy worked with geriatric and pediatric populations as a licensed occupational therapist. It is uh, this role and his commitment to helping people that inspired him to get involved in government where he could help move the community forward. A lifelong Western New Yorker, Senator Kennedy earned master's and bachelor's degrees in occupational therapy, both from a little known school down the road to Uville College. And we do know that his wife, Katie, is a person of impeccable judgment because she attended and graduated from the first great institution of higher education, Damon College. She, she's a graduate of Damon's prestigious Doctor of Physical Therapy program. It's now my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Senator Timothy Kennedy. Thank you so much, uh, President Olson, for uh, that wonderful introduction and uh, your graciousness in hosting us here today uh, and your continued leadership, uh, not only here at Damon College, but uh, throughout Western New York to uh, the Board of Trustees, the leaders that uh, have been mentioned here today. Uh, thank you so much for uh, your continued leadership and focus on continuing the extraordinary vision uh, that is Damon College and the work that historically has gone to really define our community here in uh, Buffalo, Western New York, across all of the Northeast and uh, throughout the nation. Uh, I actually um, <clears throat> had an opportunity to uh, say hello to each and every one of you beforehand. I know there was a few that came in, and I'm glad that uh, President Olson got it out of the way that I went to that other institution uh, 
to Yuval College. I, I, I was afraid I had to say that, but now that he has actually broken the mold, I will just briefly mention it. Uh, and I see that we have uh, some of the leadership here from uh, our partnering college uh, from, from Duval here as well. Uh, some folks that uh, really work to make uh, Damon College move uh, every day, the uh, Vice President of Enrollment, Frank Williams, and the Vice President of Institutional Advancement that you've heard from uh, Craig Harris. Can we just give a round of applause to all of the leaders that really make Damon College tick each and every day. And, and again, thank you uh, for your continued leadership. My friend uh, Bob Coor, uh, who joined us, and uh, my dear friend and leader, um, as has already been mentioned, but I have to mention her again because she is just an extraordinary spirit. Uh, and that is a former surrogate court judge, uh, Barbara Howe. Thank you for everything that you've done for our community over many years of service and still doing it and still doing it. <laughs> so um, President Olson mentioned my wife, my wife, Katie Kennedy, who uh, I met uh, about 17 years ago, uh, right down the road at Bornhava Preschool as I was working as an occupational therapist. Uh, she was working at Bornhava uh, as she was studying here at Damon College to be a physical therapist. Now, she had been set up to be a part of the first graduating master's class in physical therapy here at Damon. And as she got into her second semester of her fourth year, with one more year to go, the leadership at Damon decided to make it a doctorate program one of the first, if not the first, doctorate of physical therapy programs in all of Western New York. Uh, and that trend has continued throughout the country. So it, the student population had to actually take a vote, and they decided to complete their doctorate, put an entire year of work into another two semesters on top of the work that they were going to be getting uh, for their masters. And they completed their uh, DPT, uh, after five years, and I think it was the only class here at Damon and the only that I recall uh, that uh, has a five-year uh, DPT class was, was my wife's class. Graduated in 2004, and she was looking forward to being here tonight, but she had a dentist appointment, <laughs> and a dentist appointment that she had actually changed twice before, so she was actually upset about uh, having to miss this, especially it being her alma mater, but I made sure I told her that I would make sure everybody here knew that she would rather get a tooth pulled than listen to her husband give a speech. But she actually does not. She's just getting a, just a typical uh, yearly checkup. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself, um, because a lot of folks see me in the community, and President Olson talked about my work as a senator, um, and. You might see me on TV, you might read about me in the paper, but I, I want to give you a little background about who I am, what I'm about, why I tick, and, and what the driving force is really uh, in my life. Um, so I was born and, and bred in the city of Buffalo. I am one of five children, two older sisters, and two younger brothers. Um, my mother is a nurse who worked uh, three jobs as we were coming up. In the 1980s, we had a bit of a non-traditional family set up at home. Uh, my mother working three jobs, my father pretty much a stay-at-home father, but working odd jobs. He used to own a delicatessen back in the 60s. Uh, was a veteran in the United States Army, and you know, life happened. So 1971, the delicatessen closed, but all the kids still know my parents because of all the free penny candy they used to give away. So it's tr had a tremendous impact on my political career, all that free penny candy back in the day. Um, so born in 1976, I'm 41 years old. Um, you know, we uh, never had it easy. Um, I remember coming up, my uh, parents would really struggle paying the bills. And um, it was in 1990 that my father took a civil service test and passed uh, to be a Buffalo City Assessor, which at that time, as I was enrolling in high school and 
another sister in high school and one going off to college and two brothers coming up behind me, it was like a miracle uh, that now we had this second income coming in. And um, it was then really that, um, you know, we worked as a family focusing in on um, the community. My parents were very involved in the community, very involved in our church back to the 1960s, 1967 actually. My parents, and until today, over 50 years, my parents have run the baptismal classes at St. Martin of Tours Church. So every child that's ever been baptized at St. Martin since 1967, their parents have gone through the baptismal classes uh, with my family. My parents are still very involved in, in St. Martin of Tours. But the, the, the focus on community, on faith, and on family was really instilled in me. That, that hard work ethic instilled in me as a youth. My father then, 17 years later, 2007, having been promoted over the years to be a Buffalo uh, assessor at a senior level, uh, was then recommended by the outgoing commissioner of assessment, Bruna Michaud as her replacement. She had been in city government for over 40 years, 44 years actually. She recommended my father, the mayor of the city of Buffalo, the city comptroller, and the common council president all had to take a vote. It's a vote of three. They all recommended my father unanimously. And he's actually served as uh, commissioner of assessment ever since. He's 77 years old, just celebrated his 77th birthday uh, two Saturdays ago on the 7th of July. And, uh, you know, I'm pushing him to retire and uh, enjoy the, the late years of his life with my mom. Um, but he's a hard worker and he doesn't know what he would do with himself if he were to retire. My mother retired after uh, over 40 years in nursing and went back and now she's actually teaching. Uh, dare I say it at my alma mater. I won't repeat that again, uh, President Olson. I saw President Olson cringe when I said uh, the other D word. Um, and so uh, my family has really driven me um, as a youth and then coming up and, and all the values that I've talked about, but also the value of education uh, and uh, going to college and getting my master's degree in occupational therapy. Um, I was accepted to five different colleges. Uh, I decided to go to uh, Duval College and uh, get that degree in occupational therapy because my mother said when I graduated I could get a job. There would be a job waiting for you when you finish. Well, when I finished, I waited two and a half months. I couldn't find a job anywhere. But finally I did. Went to work in uh, the subacute rehab uh, with the, the McGuire group. I spoke to Frank McGuire on Friday. He's uh, still working in the community. And uh, Bob Coor with Elderwood has been a leader in that uh, work as well, helping our seniors. Um, but it's taught me, and, and, and over the years, you know, being in the private sector and then coming into government, and I'll, I'll get to that, but you know, when, you, when you come into government and you see uh, life in the shoes of, of, uh, of the folks that you represent, you come from the private sector, I think it instills in you the values of what individuals have to work toward and fight for every single day. And it helps to define the issues that I'm working on today in the state legislature, but always as a, uh, an elected official. Um, so meeting my wife was one of the greatest things that ever happened. The greatest thing that's ever happened. Make sure you tell her that if you talk to her. Um, so it was in uh, February of 2001. And I had been laid off. Uh, it was a downsizing. And my work as an occupational therapist was actually replaced by an occupational therapy assistant. And for three months, I was not only laid off, but uh, collecting unemployment and really fighting and dealing with the issues that come with being unemployed and being out of work. Uh, I, I recognize how hard that is. Th those are real struggles that people face in our community, I've, I've lived with it. I've felt those issues. I've felt that pain and that hurt and that need and that desire. And quite frankly, um, the anticipation and concern of not being able potentially to find gainful employment. I've lived in those shoes. Um, 
I was able to find a part-time job over here, and I thought oh, I'd never work with kids uh, when I was in college. But I studied just in case I did work with children uh, someday. I did study that uh, area of occupational therapy, and lo and behold, when uh, I never thought I would, here I was, right down the block. About a month after starting at uh, Born Harbor Preschool, I met my wife, and I suppose the rest is history. And uh, we were married in October of 2004. Uh, we were going to wait five years. We had this great plan, five years when we have our first baby, life, we're going to have all these things happen. And five weeks later, my wife was pregnant. Before we had our first anniversary, not only did we have our first child, but he was already baptized and everything else. We were well on our way. Um, so, so our son Connor will be 13 years old uh, this upcoming July 30th. Uh, so I'm going to have a teenager, which really scares me right now. Um, we also have uh, two other beautiful children. We have a nine-year-old daughter. Uh, nine years old, going on 19. She, by the way, can do no wrong in my eyes. Uh, my boys, of course, can do no right. And we have a uh, six-year-old who will soon be seven on uh, the 23rd of July. So um, they are really what drives me as, uh, I believe, uh, our families really are the driving force in each of our lives, trying to make their lives a little bit better off than we had it coming up, uh, as my parents did for us. But those same values that my parents instilled in me, the values of hard work, the values of faith, the values of community, and the values of education are all things that we are focusing in to helping uh, bring our children up. So right after we were married, and right after we, uh, my wife was pregnant, I was appointed to the Erie County Legislature. That five-year plan took another turn. And in December of 2004, December 22nd, to be exact, 2004, I was appointed to the Erie County Legislature. And uh, Brian Higgins, Congressman Higgins, who had uh, been in the New York State Assembly, actually gave up his seat in the Assembly to run for Congress, to fill the seat of uh, outgoing Congress member Jack Quinn. There was then a void for his Assembly seat, Mark Schroeder, who is now the Buffalo City Comptroller, uh, backfilled his position in the assembly. His seat was then vacant in the Erie County Legislature. I was appointed by the Democratic Committee to that seat. Won then uh, the following year uh, in, a, in a Democratic primary in the general. And fast forward to uh, 2010. Um, six years later, uh, I decided to run for New York State Senate. But in those six years, and quite frankly, in my first few months of the Erie County Legislature, government was really turned upside down on its head. If you all recall, the red-green budget in Erie County. Very difficult times. A thousand people laid off. Um, government really ceased to exist in Erie County because of pure and utter mismanagement. There, were, there had been a $400 million tobacco settlement and the fight that had ensued between the county executive at the time, before I got there, and in, in the early 2000s, and the county legislature, was who was going to cut taxes more? So for political purposes, and driven by those political purposes, they were trying to out-politicize each other and out-tax uh, cut, tax cut each other. And they did. And $400 million later, um, the budget then was in a major crisis because there wasn't enough funding that was coming in to sustain the government. And so government turned on its head, uh, and we got to see all, unfortunately, the, the underbelly of, of government. But for me, as a brand new Erie County Legislature, it was an incredible learning experience for me because I got to see and hear from each commissioner what exactly they do in that area of government. Uh, I got to see and hear and feel what government does for people, how government acts as a hand up, how government acts as a safety net in our community. 
and really is there to lend a helping hand when people need it the most. When people need it the most. Uh, so that was an extraordinary learning experience for me. Fast forward six years. Uh, we did a lot of great things, including focusing in on helping working families in our community, uh, instilling one of the first uh, apprenticeship employment opportunities in the entire state of New York, quite frankly, the entire nation on public works projects to make sure that we were training up the youth in our community, making sure we're diversifying the workforce in our community. Um, a bill that I sponsored uh, was the first of its kind in the state which banned texting and driving here in Erie County because New York State had dropped the ball, if you recall, back in 2009 when they banned texting and driving but only as a secondary offense. And so you could actually drive by a state trooper, you could drive by a state trooper texting away, but if you weren't speeding or doing something else, that trooper couldn't pull you over because it was a secondary offense. Um, there was a woman by the name of Kelly Larson who had lost her son, I'm sorry, Kelly Klein, who had lost her son, A.J. Larson, 21 years old, who had rolled a stop sign in West Seneca, was hit and killed by an oncoming vehicle who was the driving force in that initiative. So we, those were just a couple of things that, that we had done among many, many other things in uh, county government. But the real focus was on state government now. And if you recall, in 2009 and 2010, it was dark days here in the state of New York. The state had gone from more prosperous times, and the recession was in full swing. Uh, there was a $10 billion budget deficit. Uh, there was cuts happening left and right. And it seemed as if the leaders in Albany couldn't get out of their own way. It seemed as if those folks in Albany were just going along for the ride and just simply doing things the way they had always done them. And so I stepped up and decided to take on a, a nearly 30-year incumbent of the state legislature, Bill Stokowski. Uh, and there were two other um, uh, individuals that decided to run that year in a Democratic primary. So it was a four-way primary campaign. Uh, and then I was up against um, a very well-known, well-heeled Republican uh, by the name of Jack Quinn III. And uh, Jack Quinn III's father was already mentioned, uh, Congressman Jack Quinn Jr. Uh, by the way, two tremendous people, but uh, on the other side of the aisle. And so here it came, the focus of the state on uh, this district that I, that, that I now represent, or portion of it that I now represent, the 58th State Senate District. Uh, I was elected in the primary, catapulted to uh, victory in November. That was the same year that uh, Governor Cuomo had won. Uh, there was a huge changeover. There had been an over 90 plus percent return of incumbents on both sides of the aisle and in both chambers the Assembly and the Senate. And uh, the fact that I was elected among 13 brand new senators out of 62 senators was really a transformation in and of itself within the Senate. Uh, now I'm in the top third, after eight years, I'm in the top third of seniority uh, within the Senate. So there's been a tremendous changeover. Uh, but there's been a lot of things that have gone on over the course of the last eight years, a lot of things that we're very, very proud of uh, that we've been able to work toward and deliver here uh, for our community. And uh, you know, we're excited about where we are, we're excited about where we're going, but you know, I really truly believe that um, the only way we are going to see uh, the, the, the highest potential of our community is if we work together, is if we work in a bipartisan fashion, and is if we drive from a very grassroots, community-oriented standpoint the issues and the initiatives that are needed here in uh, uh, Buffalo. So some of the things that we've worked on and some of the accomplishments that uh, we've been able to bring here uh, to our community. 
Um, some of you have probably seen the work that we've done in protecting children. Uh, just last weekend, I was up at Sheridan Park to celebrate a young boy who's now eight years old. I met him when he was just one, one and a half. His name is J.J. Bolvin, and he was abused by his father when he was 11 weeks old. He broke bones throughout his body, gave him two to 300 epileptic seizures every day, and he had already abused another one of his own children and broken another one of his son's arms. And so he was a repeat abuser. But yet, the state law only gave him a slap on the wrist. His family came to us and asked us to champion a bill that would help to hold repeat child abusers to a higher level of scrutiny. And so what we did is just that. So now in the state of New York, we enhanced penalties for repeat child abusers. And that law is actually called JJ's Law. It was a major accomplishment of ours. Um, and that's just something as a father of three that I find so grotesque and despicable to think that these abuses are happening throughout anywhere, anywhere in society in general. Uh, but sometimes in, in the homes right around us, we don't even know it. Uh, we've seen time after time these abuses that are taking place. And part of government is making sure that we're holding individuals accountable for the laws that they're breaking and the people that they're hurting. That is a piece of what we have done is fighting for uh, children and families. Um, at the same time, we talk about the, the good things that are happening and the economic activity that's happening in our community and the ability for us to take advantage of the economic growth and boom that is really transpiring all around us, the positive things. When we talk about uh, the jobs that are coming in and the ability for individuals throughout Western New York to fill these jobs. Uh, there are thousands of jobs that we know about that are going unfilled throughout Western New York every single month because there is a skills gap. There are individuals that we know that want to go to work that are either unemployed or underemployed but they can't fill these jobs because they don't have the proper training. So what have we done about it? We have made, collectively, starting with a state investment of $44 million, and then added to it out of the gate about four years ago from the city of Buffalo another $4 million. Plus, over the next several years, different organizations and companies and faith-based organizations and businesses all coming together. What is transpiring before us today, which will be online next month, is the Northland Corridor Training Center. This is going to be the first of its kind, a model not only for the rest of the state, but for the nation to follow suit. Individuals that want to go to work, that don't have those skills, are going to be able to go to the Northland Corridor training facility to find those jobs that they want to fill and to get that training to fill those jobs in every single industry, in every single area of our community. And there's a reason that we've put a focus on the training, and it's because we recognize that people in our community want to go to work. They want to go to work. They want to help themselves. They want to help their families. They want to pull themselves up by the bootstraps, like my families did, like many of you did, like your families did, like your parents and grandparents did. Help yourselves and help the next generation. But they need that opportunity. And so the Northland Corridor Training Facility is a $100 million investment that's going to do just that. And we talk about jobs, and we've talked about jobs for many years. 
The goal has been to bring them here. And now they're coming. Now they're finally coming here. Now we can connect those dots. Part of my job as an elected leader has been trying to help individuals one at a time and groups where I can. And it seems like sometimes my office is like a uh, human resources network. People come to my office, they look for a job, we want to help. My business is helping people. My work, whether it's in government, or my work as an occupational therapist is driven by helping people. And I know from my own personal experience, and I know from the individuals that I'm working with and seeing and talking to every single day, that oftentimes the best way to help an individual is to help them find that job, help them find that employment, help them help themselves and their families. So over the years, as these requests have come in, I sort of started back and forth. If there was a job that somebody needed, I would say, give me your resume. And if I hear something, I'll be in touch. And that sort of morphed into um, an effort based out of my office that we would take all of the resumes. And when we heard about a number of jobs, we would send out an email. And if people saw a job that they liked, they'd let us know. And so over the years, we sort of honed this and sharpened it. And it got better and better and better. And so about a year ago, we unveiled something that's not earth shattering or monumental or reinventing the wheel, but it's simply a tool. It's a website. It's called kennedyjobs.com. Very simple. It's my name jobs on a website and we update it as often as we get jobs that come in at least once a week we are updating this website we work with the local community we work with the business community we work with the Department of Labor we work with the Buffalo Employment and Training Center and we'll work with the Northland Corridor Training Center as well we will work with all levels of government there are government jobs there are private sector jobs there are jobs at large corporations, there are jobs at uh, micro businesses. Uh, any job that we hear about, we want to connect people. But I also know through my work that in order to help someone get a job, they need to know what they, they need to tell us what they need. Individuals, are, we're all different. And individuals that are looking for a job, I might have something, but it might not be a good fit. So instead of trying to fit a uh, square peg into a round hole. We ask folks, take a look at the website. If you see something you like, let us know. We'll get after it. Uh, it's just a way to link people with uh, job opportunities. We've held job fairs to the tune of individuals coming in to these job fairs uh, with thousands of jobs available. We had over 3,000 jobs available with over 1,200 individual participants, job seekers, on one day alone from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. down at the Buffalo Convention Center. It was just an extraordinary sight to see that there are jobs available and there are job seekers out there, but it's also driving force for me because I know these are life-changing initiatives uh, that we can do. Um, Protecting seniors has been something that's been an extraordinary um, issue we've been focused on. Helping seniors live independently, having worked as an occupational therapist in the homes, in the community, in subacute rehab facilities, recognizing that seniors need our help, recognizing that senior, seniors need to be able to afford to live in their homes. So what do I have? I have a bill that would actually freeze property taxes for seniors when they get to the age of 65. They'll still have to pay taxes, but they'll know that they won't have to play roulette every single year, whether or not their taxes are gonna go up through the roof. They'll know where their taxes are based upon the fact that they're frozen uh, at that age. We're focusing in on helping individuals and families. We were able to increase the minimum wage in New York State because seven and a quarter an hour is putting people in poverty. 
when they're working 40 hours a week. And it's just not acceptable. So we drove that and we got it done. We also helped to instill one of the first paid family leave initiatives in the entire nation. So that when families have a life-altering, life-changing event at home, whether it's a birth of a child, whether it's a death of a loved one, or an oncoming family crisis, we can plan for those. Businesses can plan for those. Individuals and their families can plan for those. And they're not going to have to worry about whether or not they have a place to go back to work afterwards. These are some of the things that uh, we're focusing on and continuing to drive forward. My district that I represent today is a little different than the district that I was elected to back in 2010. In 2010, I had a, about a third of the city of Buffalo. And I had the town of Chictawaga, the town of West Seneca, the city of Lackawanna, the town of Hamburg, and the town of Eden. Today, my district in 2012, which had shifted and changed, pushed me into the city. So I represent about three quarters of the city of Buffalo and still the town of Chictawaga and the city of Lackawanna. I no longer represent Hamburg and Eden and West Seneca. Um, but my district changed in other ways as well. The demographics of my district changed. My district today, I would argue, is one of the poorest districts, not only in the state, but in the nation. 91% of the households in my district, the household income, is less than $100,000. 2018, for a household income, it's not all that much money. Money continues, continues to be diluted as inflation goes up. 91% of the homes in my district have a household income of less than $100,000. 40% of the households in my district make below $25,000 as a household income. Think about that. I represent over 300,000 people. 40% of the households in my district make below $25,000. And there are 25,000 children in my district that live below the federal poverty line. 25 thousand children in my district that live below the federal poverty line. So I tell you a little bit about who I am because when you think about the district I represent today and who I represent and how I think and the work that we have to do and the problems that we have those are the things that make me tick. Those are the driving forces. Because there are so many families in our community that are in need. There are families in need. There are people that need help. When my office staff, whenever they come to work for me, and I have the best staff, I'll tell you, in the entire state of New York, some of which are here today. When the phone rings in my office, it's not somebody typically calling to say thank you, and those calls are great and they happen every now and then. But it's because somebody needs help. We're here to help people. We're here to act as an advocate for the community. And so many of the initiatives that we deal with in the state government, that I deal with, that I drive forward, whether we're talking about focusing in on education, focusing in on helping individuals live a life of independence, focusing in on helping our community get rid of this senseless, needless, tragic violence that's encapsulating all of us and putting us all backwards. There's no hiding from it. It impacts all of us. Whether it's focusing in on helping working families pull themselves up out of poverty, find that job, these are the things that drive me. If we can help one individual at a time and help their families, that's one less family that might get caught up in the violence 
might get caught up in poverty. Education uh, is one of my biggest priorities. Why? Because we've all heard that phrase, education is a great equalizer. Well, it is. I'm a believer. I know you're all believers here at Damon. Education is the equalizer. So we've been able to bring in a record level of funding for public schools across the state of New York, including the city of Buffalo, where so many children are living in poverty. I've invested my own children into the new vision of the Buffalo Public Schools. All three of my children are being educated in Buffalo Public Schools. They are on the move. The trajectory is right. It is real. It is upward. In the last five years, we were able to bring in Say Yes to Education. Say Yes to Education has had a monumental, different, made a monumental difference in the graduation rates. I believe, in the Buffalo Public Schools. They've gone up by double digits, 17% from 47%, we were underwater, 47% six years ago to uh, five years ago when Say Yes was implemented to 64% today. There's still way too many children that are not graduating from our public school systems. And if you read the paper today, you'll see that there are still too many children they're dropping out of college once they get there. There's no silver bullet for any of this. There is no one riding in on a great white horse and saying, I or we have all the answers. But we, what we do know is that with hard work, with rolling up our sleeves, with using that blue collar, strong, family-oriented, community, faith-based network that each and every one of us have, individually, but putting it together collectively, listening to the people, listening to the issues, taking them head on, trying to solve one problem, whether it's for an individual or a group, one at a time, that we can make the world a better place, that we can make our community a better place. The investment that's happening in our community has been astronomical. Seven billion dollars in economic development happening in the, in the city of Buffalo center today seven billion dollars of economic growth that's happening we see the higher education institutions like damon that are putting a strategic focus on investing in the future not only of the students but the growth of the campus the growth of the curriculum and an expansion of higher education because we know the best way to keep our youth here is to give them that higher education and then allow them to fill these jobs that are coming in. These new state-of-the-art, new highly technologically advanced jobs, new medical research jobs, new jobs in the field of animation and research and medicine and science that Damon is so proud to drive forward. These are the things that are gonna help us go to the next level. And you think about where we started from, and I'll leave you with this, and we'll open it up for questions. But when, when, when uh, I was coming up and uh, going to college and driving through the center of the city, it was in the early 1990s, when there was an economic boom happening across the entire nation. A lot of people getting rich. Buffalo missed the boat. Buffalo missed the boat. And it was my friends, and it was my family, and it was my brothers and sisters, and it was your children, and your brothers and sisters, and families, and grandkids that were leaving by the tens of thousands. 50,000 people between the ages of 18 and 35, my generation, between 2000, 1999 and 2010, left Western New York to find jobs and opportunity elsewhere because they couldn't find a job. Now the jobs are coming in. We need to make sure we're keeping those kids here. We're making sure that when they get that training, that they stay here, that they set up their family roots. I'm driving through the city of Buffalo to go to college, to be an occupational therapist, not thinking about the politics, but thinking about our community, thinking about the city that I'm living in, thinking about giving back and saying, you know what? I want to do something about this community. 
I want to do something about the city. I want to do something and pull ourselves out of this rut that we were in. In the glory days of Buffalo being talked about at the turn of the century is beautiful. But to me, that's hi history. That's history. I want to see our glory days right now. I want to see our glory days tomorrow and in the next five years, in the next 10 years, in the next 20 years. I want to see my children and your children and grandchildren be able to stay here if they want to. And we all know that Buffalo and Western New York is the greatest place to live, work, and raise a family, not only in the entire nation, but I would argue in the entire world. We know what we have here. We know the gem that we have here in Buffalo and Western New York. It's up to us to cultivate our community and to raise ourselves up together. But deciding to dive in head first, roll up our sleeves, and be a part of that change is so important. And I'm always urging folks to get involved. The best advice I was ever given was in college when my professor, Dr. Olga Mendel, said to me, have you ever thought about getting involved in politics? <laughs> and I said, you know what? I think about it every day as I'm driving through the city of Buffalo. But I don't know how. You know what she said to me? Volunteer. Volunteer. So I took that advice, I dove in head first, and I never looked back. So I would urge each and every one of you, you're never too young and you're never too old. Volunteer, be a part of the change, effectuate change, let us know what's on your mind. Let us know what you want to see, how you want to see our community grow, and what your vision is so that we can help make your vision a part of Buffalo and Western New York's tomorrow. I'm so honored to be here in your presence, and I'll open it up to uh, any questions. Thank you so much. Certainly. Um, you know, one of the things that, and thank you for your question, thank you for your work and your, and your volunteerism and your advocacy, and the Center for Elder Law and Justice is really um, an, a, an amazing, an amazing organization that does great work. Um, and at the center of their work are the people. And um, again, there are so many individuals in our community that uh, need advocates. And uh, when an individual uh, oftentimes can no longer live in their own home, uh, they need a place to live. Long-term care is the place where many thousands of individuals, our families, turn. Uh, and that then becomes their home. So it's essential that um, there is a level of communication that happens between um, the Department of Health and these institutions. And if there is repeat offenses, de depending on what they are, there are very, very egregious and very high level, dangerous uh, uh, citations that happen throughout the state, throughout the country at some of these homes. Uh, those need to be prioritized. Uh, 
and those need to be rectified immediately. And if there are homes that are not following the law or are not rectifying the, uh, and taking the, the, the proper course to rectify the dangerous situations that they may put our loved ones in, then they need to be held accountable, both in fines and potentially um, citations or uh, closures. And we've seen that. Uh, homes that are not good actors, that are bad actors, that take advantage of the system. And when these individual homes do that, uh, it hurts all of us. And it puts uh, our loved ones in harm's way. Um, there are other, when you talk about re repetitive citations, there are other low level things, you know, wh whether it's uh, if something is, is not clean or, or, or Coming from the coming from the th that subacute rehab world, um, you know, a wheelchair um, pedal might be misplaced or something like that. That's different and still needs to be rectified. But when you're talking about putting someone in harm's way, uh, these, especially these egregious citations, need to be dealt with uh, immediately and with strength uh, and with serious follow-up. There's no question. Is there, I guess, a suggested way to bring those issues to the top where, I don't know, because sometimes there'll be instances where the Department of Health will just say, you know, it stays within our parameters and we'll handle it and we'll take the course of action. When they don't, what's the best route to take that? Yeah, so one thing that we're working on right now is what's called a uh, safe staffing ratio. And uh, for those of you that uh, don't know what the safe staffing ratio is, uh, it is ensuring that um, healthcare facilities have the proper staffing levels in place to take care of our loved ones. When you have proper staffing in place, the wheels should turn much smoother and our loved ones should be much safer and the issues that might be small and large can be dealt with in a much more expeditious manner if you have the proper staffing levels. The unfortunate part of um, healthcare is that there have been bad actors that have taken advantage of the system, that have put our loved ones and our community members in harm's way um, by scaling back on staff to save a few bucks. And what happens? They might save a few dollars, but the system, the facility itself, starts to struggle simply to do the work on behalf of the residents on a daily basis. So I believe strongly that the legislation that we have proposed will ensure that the state safe staffing levels in our healthcare facilities are followed, that it brings those bad actors in line, it holds them accountable, um, and it ensures that um, those facilities are a bit safer. Okay, I believe we have time for one more question. Yes. Thank you, Senator Kennedy, for your, your comments and for the um, wonderful work that you do. Um, those of us here that are in um, the private college sector um, appreciate your efforts in um, uh, bringing higher education to as many of your constituents as possible. Um, we've, uh, of course, um, experienced a, a impact from the Excelsior program and I just wonder if um, you could comment on that as an alum of a private college and, and um, think of, th share your advice for those of us in the private um, college sector for you know, how we can be part of this um, initiative and, and um, you know, help expand the opportunities for, for our, the many students in the area. 
Yeah, I appreciate that uh, comment very much and, and, and that thought. And we have been uh, working uh, with the leaders of the independent and private colleges across the state to, to do just that. Uh, the Excelsior program, uh, the goal of the Excelsior program is to really give individuals that may not have had that opportunity uh, to get a, the funding for a uh, college or university education um, the, to get that education and to, 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 to no longer have finances as a barrier. I think it's essential that we on the back end, so as we are um, promoting the Excelsior program at the public institutions, I think it's absolutely essential that we ensure that there is a robust level of financial aid support from the state uh, through TAP and other resources for our uh, private institutions. I believe that the more we give individuals an opportunity to have a choice uh, but to get rid of that financial barrier, the better off we're all going to be. Um, and as someone, again, as you mentioned, that uh, came up through a private institution, uh, and I'm still paying my student loans. Um, you know, I recognize the cost of college and university tuition is not getting any cheaper. And most likely it never will. So what we wanted to do is make sure everyone had an opportunity, uh, especially those folks that don't have the means to afford it, uh, and may even feel the perception of being cut out keeps them from even, even thinking about pursuing those dreams of a higher education. Um, so again, there's no easy solution, but as long as on the back end of Excelsior that we're continuing to promote and make that financial assistance to private institutions as robust as possible to ensure the viability of private institutions like Damon, like my alma mater, uh, and, and many, many others across our state, I think the better off we'll be. Let me uh, thank Senator Kennedy for coming and spending time with us. Thank you. 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 Thank you.